I've been covering the Mandela Effect for a long time, and for every new Mandela Effect that is discovered, an older one gets updated. New residue is found, new developments are made, sometimes the mystery deepens, and on rare occasions, Mandela Effects can even be solved. I've thought about this for a long time, as to what I should do. Should I simply ignore these updates? Briefly mention them in brand new Mandela Effect videos? Or something else? This is that something else. An entirely new series dedicated to new Mandela Effect updates. So whenever enough of these new developments are made or discovered, you can expect a new video. And don't worry, this doesn't replace the brand new Mandela Effect videos. This is in addition to those, so you're just getting twice as much content. So without wasting any more of your time, let's get right into these new and interesting developments. First up, I want to talk about an interesting find regarding the Fruit of the Loom Mandela Effect. I first talked about this in Brand New Mandela Effects Part 24. This update is in regards to a photo taken in 1939 of an extremely poor family's house during the Great Depression. The family's wallpaper is made from glued up newspaper clippings. And if you look at this specific place on the wall, you'll see an ad for Fruit of the Loom. At first glance, this ad appears blurry, but it looks like it has a cornucopia in it. If it does indeed have a cornucopia, this proves that the Fruit of the Loom artwork has changed. The debate around this photograph has caused a lot of argument online. And because of this, I decided to use an AI upscaler to enhance the details and see for myself. Now remember, this company swears it never used a cornucopia in any of its company branding. In fact, we have an entire visual list of all of their previous logos. So after enhancing this, what did I find? Well, once I zoomed in and enhanced the blurry old mess of a photo, I discovered this. Yeah, it's not pretty, but it tells us a lot. After rotating it and going through a mess of old logos, I finally found one that matches. It's the 1893 to 1927 Fruit of the Loom logo, meaning this newspaper had been hanging on their wall for over a decade. It also means that this logo doesn't have a cornucopia. I know it looked like it did from afar, but unfortunately the mystery still remains. You'd think that's it for the Fruit of the Loom residue, but I've actually got two more updates for you. First up is a trademark filed in 1973 and granted in 1974 by Fruit of the Loom. This trademark was in fact for a deodorant, now here is the interesting thing about this trademark. It has a piece of art attached to it, which I'm showing you now. I'd like you to analyze this piece of art right here as I read the literal description for the trademark. Berries, grapes, alone or in bunches, apples, baskets, bowls, and other containers of fruits, including cornucopia, horn of plenty. Now why would Fruit of the Loom, a company who swears to have never used a cornucopia in any of their artwork ever, claim a cornucopia in their trademark. I don't know about you, but I find that pretty strange. The trademark was eventually cancelled, which you might think, oh, they realized the mistake by adding a cornucopia in the description, and then cancelled the trademark right away. But that's not what happened. This cancellation took place in 1988, a full 15 years after it was first registered. Fun fact, while researching this, I learned that Fruit of the Loom is one of the earliest trademarks in America, given the number 418. Their first trademark was given one year after trademark laws were first passed by Congress. Not only that, the trademark predates Coca-Cola, the paper bag, and even the light bulb. The last thing I have to say about Fruit of the Loom in this video is in regards to Breaking Bad. I was re-watching Breaking Bad for the 20th time because it's such a phenomenal show in every regard, and I caught something really funny. In Season 2, Episode 6, there is a sign shown for a fictional company called Rio Grande, Fruits and Vegetables. Beside that name is a fake company's logo, a cornucopia filled with a variety of interesting fruits and veggies. This is obviously a reference to the classic Fruit of the Loom cornucopia that never existed, and we all know about it for completely unknown and mysterious reasons. What do you think? Continuing on with Breaking Bad, that isn't the only Mandela Effect reference I caught during my rewatch. In Season 4, Episode 8, there is a scene where Saul Goodman, the funny lawyer character, makes a reference to Ed McMahon giving away money. Is he doing? Hey, look, I don't mind dropping checks off every week like Ed McMahon, but uh, if you really want to know how they're doing, why don't you go see for yourself? If you don't know what this is, I don't blame you. I've never covered this Mandela effect on my channel because it's pretty old, but essentially it's the belief that Ed McMahon used to deliver these giant oversized publishers clearinghouse checks to winners. As the story goes today, Ed McMahon never delivered giant checks and never worked with Publishers Clearinghouse. Any proof or evidence to the contrary is simply gone. It doesn't exist anymore outside of people's memories and references to Ed McMahon from people's memories. 
The weird part about this in Breaking Bad, though, is that show is one of the finest crafted shows ever made. Every scene, every line of dialogue, every shot and angle, even the costume design and color choices have meaning. So much love and attention went into every part of that show, and yet somehow a person that never gave away money got referenced in this show for giving away money. The origin of this line must have come up as a funny line in the writer's room, and everyone obviously believed Ed McMahon gave away money, so no further research was needed to make sure that it's accurate. Of course it's accurate, everyone believes it. It just goes to show how mysterious and powerful the Mandela Effect really is. Not a single person there was like, hey, that's not true. Continuing on with the topic of Ed McMahon, Ed McMahon made some commercials back in the day for FreeCreditReport.com, and in those commercials he's actually rapping. As bizarre as that is, what's even more bizarre is that he talks about handing big checks to people. And the joke of the commercial is that he's going back to all of those houses and trying to get his checks back because he needs money. It's a great and funny commercial, but it doesn't make any sense considering he apparently never worked for Publishers Clearinghouse and never personally delivered any oversized checks to anyone. The way it goes now is that Ed McMahon was a spokesperson for American Family Publishers, another company that gave out giant checks to winners. But Ed McMahon never once personally gave out a giant check. Not once. Even more amazingly, most people don't seem to remember American Family Publishers. What do you remember about all this? This one is really weird, and we could honestly talk about it for an hour because there's so much residue, so if you'd like to hear more about this in the next video, let me hear it in the comments. This specific Mandela effect is a gold mine. It feels like someone went in, like a computer program, and changed these two details. Ed McMahon never delivered any checks, and he never worked for Publishers Clearinghouse. Despite all the contrary evidence, it's so strange. Here is a clever and funny Mandela Effect Easter egg hidden away in the television show Mr. Robot. In Season 3 Episode 4, there is a scene where Darlene is on her laptop and downloading a movie in the background. If you look closely, you'll see that the movie she's downloading is the 1996 movie Shazam, starring Sinbad that doesn't exist and apparently never has. Sure, a lot of us remember it, but no one has found a single trace of it ever existing one of those really weird ones that I'm not sure will ever be resolved. Regardless of resolution, stuff like this is a fun wink and a nod to fans of the Mandela Effect, and I figured you'd enjoy hearing about it. I'm hoping that as we go forward, even more media makes references to stuff like this. And speaking of media, I'm working hard on my Lost Media video. I'm tackling Lost Media in a very different perspective than most people do, so I'm excited to share it with you, look forward to it. We still have two more new Mandela Effect updates to cover in this video. But first, I want to tell you all to go subscribe to my other channel, All Time Clips. Link in the description. We're trying to get that channel to a total of 5,000 subscribers, so let's make it happen. Definitely go subscribe. Up next is a Mandela effect that I've never covered on All Time. It's the whole Judge Judy has never used her gavel in any of the episodes of her courtroom drama. When I first heard of this, this one seemed so absurd to me, I couldn't believe it. At the time it became popular, I really enjoyed looking into it, and reading about it, and watching the hilarious reactions to it but I couldn't give my stamp of approval until I had watched every episode of Judge Judy to confirm it or deny it. Thankfully, enough people took on the challenge and eventually it was discovered that Judge Judy did indeed use her gavel on multiple occasions. Bye. Bodies are excused. All right. Dismiss. Why you got here? Hey. Should have put one on you. Yeah. Yeah. She she I to, can't hear everybody at the same time. She was supposed to have 24 hour oxygen. Did you? Did you hear this? My sister has never done anything Did you hear my this? Mother. Did, I gave her watch this. entire life. I don't want to use it. As I look through all these videos of her using the gavel, the most hilarious one comes from season one where she slams her gavel down in an episode and says this. No, that's not my signature. Oh, come on. It's not just no, a I forged it. Hey. Sure. Listen, I don't like to use this thing. It's a recent innovation of mine oh, because I can't keep people Anna. quiet. I've covered Britney Spears twice already, once about a missing headset microphone, and again regarding a supposed gray plaid skirt that she wore in the 1998 Baby One More Time music video. The overwhelming majority of people remember her skirt being plaid, but now it's simply black. Well, this new Mandela Effect update is in reference to that Mandela Effect. A few years back, Britney Spears dressed up for Halloween in a throwback outfit and posted it to Instagram. She was dressed in a schoolgirl outfit influenced by the outfit she wore in her music video years before. Now when this was originally posted, the Mandela effect surrounding it wasn't really known yet. The change in skirt design and color hadn't been noticed yet, but in the years since, it's become quite the interesting find. In the Instagram photo, Britney is actually wearing a gray plaid skirt, like everyone seems to remember her wearing in her music video. Perhaps Britney also remembers it being gray and plaid, or perhaps she couldn't find or purchase a black skirt in time for Halloween. 
Whatever the case, it's interesting that she herself dressed the way so many people remember her dressing, but not how she actually dressed in the Baby One More Time music video. Was all this simply a mistake on her part or a bad memory? Is it as simple as she just didn't look up any reference to her outfit? Or maybe she did look up her video and the skirt had not changed yet. Stuff like this makes the Mandela effect so interesting to me.